to another edition of TiffinCast. I'm your host, Seishu. Today, I'm speaking with Don Giannotti, a photographer and designer and author of several books on photography and the business of photography. And he's also presented at Creative Live. Uh, Don's a friend. I've, I've uh, had the pleasure of taking his workshop in Boston many, many years ago. And we have kept in touch. And it's always a pleasure to speak with Don and especially read what Don's written about photography and now it's no different because he's just got a new book coming out called Musings, 28 Essays on Photography, and I think it should be read by every photographer out there. Now, let me repeat that. It's a book called Musings, 28 Essays on Photography, and it should be read by every photographer out there. It's very, very important that you, you do pick it up. And there are two ways you can do that. One is to, to buy through Amazon and the other way would be to sign up for Don's uh, wonderful newsletter called In the Frame. And if you sign up for In the Frame, you get the PDF, and you get to read the PDF, and you get to enjoy it. Don, thanks for joining us again. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Uh, I know you're on the West Coast, or at least the at least on Pacific yep. time. So, and no, you're I'm in mountain time. I'm in. Oh, you're I'm mountain in. time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in any case, you are in a, in a time zone and a, in a weather zone that's much, much more conducive to hanging out and drinking beers and that kind of thing. So I'm a little jealous of you right now, Don. No, it's, it's, it's brutal here right now. It's uh, <laughs> five and sunny. Oh, uh -huh. sure. Terrible. We're going to have to let this, we have to close the schools pretty soon. Right, right. Too much nice weather, so. <laughs> um. Uh, let me jump right into the into the why of why I mean you've written many many articles and you've compiled them and this is this new book is a compilation of your your thoughts about the photography industry and and what it means to be a photographer in this day and age. Um, what motivates you to write about what's going on? Well, I really love I mean I love what I do and I love photography um, so much. Um, there's a lot of stuff written out there, and I found myself um, seeing a lot of stuff that didn't appeal to me necessarily, but I'm sure it appeals to other people. And I thought, you know what? I want to write stuff that I would want to read if I was getting into this business, more um, stuff to think about, stuff to motivate you, because it's it's hard to stay motivated sometimes in this, in this business, and that um, it's a tough business to be in. Uh, I think, I think every business is a tough business to be in. So I don't think we're any, any more special than anyone else. But there's a lot of things to think about, and most of the writings that are in this uh, this little book were uh, they were all done for the newsletter uh, over the period of a year. So I've just compiled them, uh, edited them up a little bit, and present them out there. And there there are things to think about. There's some pragmatic um, how to how to get the best models off Model Mayhem and Craigslist, there's some pragmatic stuff, there's some philosophical stuff, but most of it is there to uh, let the photographer know that they're not alone, that there's a lot of questions to be asked, uh, asked and answered out there, and that, that there's no one answer to any question. Lots and lots of different uh, ways to go. Uh, there, there's uh, obviously 28 essays in, in this book. Uh, what one essay jumps out at you as being the first thing that photographers should read when when they get the book? Um, I think they should re first. I think they should read the first chapter, um, which is uh, Scarcityville versus Abundanceville, and I find that so many photographers live in Scarcityville. They think that someone else's success takes from them because there's only a limited amount. Uh, success is scarce. Um, they think that because other people have cameras that it somehow uh, will diminish their business, and it doesn't. Uh, we, we should be in Abundanceville where um, we help other people achieve their success because there's nothing better um, than everybody being successful. That just brings business up. It brings personal relationships up. Uh, another one that, I, that I'm really proud of is part of the mantra that I use um, on all my websites and my dealings with photographers is first be a photographer. And I know, and I don't want to sound like I'm kvetching about 
guys who get a camera for Christmas and open up a studio. I'm not that, you know, if you're good enough to do that, great. I wasn't, but fine. Um, but in every endeavor that I know of, uh, creative and something that requires talent, football, playing the oboe, first you have to be a football player before you get on the team. They don't bring you on the team to train you to be a football player. If you can't play the oboe, chances are very good you're not going to get a job in a symphony. They're not going to bring on a guy named Bill and go, hey, let's give you the oboe. We'll just have you sit in and, and you'll pick it up. It won't be that hard. And yet in photography, we see that a lot. We see uh, people not wanting to go to workshops or not wanting to spend money on training. I remember um, reading about a, a fabulous set of DVDs that a photographer had done uh, really showing the, the, showing the backside of professional photographer, uh, what it's like to do a job when there's three assistants and there's a time crunch and everything. And I don't remember what he was charging, but 150 bucks, 175 and so many people, oh, that's too expensive. Well, if you don't have the opportunity to go and assist somebody, $175 to find out exactly how that works is dirt cheap. It's unbelievably inexpensive. And, um, and the same with the, with the Creative Live. I think the folks at Creative Live have uh, provided extreme values for, um, what are they, $99 or $149 at something in that price range? Right. You could get five of those, those things, and it would take you at least six months to go through them because you should watch and then do and then watch and then do and refine and watch again. Um, and so you're going to, you're going to pay a little over 400 bucks, maybe 500 bucks for a, what would be a, 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 an entire semester at a university, which last time I checked was a lot more money and also a lot slower that they, the pace is, you know, like molasses in winter at universities. So there's a, you know, first be a photographer so that photography is, um, almost second nature to you and then go out to become you know a business person with that uh, talent uh, you sort of hit on a topic that's uh, very dear to me and that is uh, the sense of value whether photographers value their own work whether clients value the photographers work in any case it comes down to what is value and so whether it's a workshop, for instance, you mentioned a workshop and someone was like, you know, moaning about not being able to afford a workshop or going to a workshop. Well, $500 to a workshop versus sitting around and not knowing how to light, for instance. I mean, it's a no-brainer. You go to a workshop, learn how to light, and you make great images for your clients down the, down the line. And you charge them $250 per headshot session or whatever it is. And you can get that, you know the cost of the workshop in two sittings. Um, why is it that photographers, and particularly photographers, aren't, aren't able to, to make that switch in their heads to say, this is valuable and we should pursue it versus, um, you know, this current mindset like, okay, I can do it myself. I don't need anybody's help. And, and just sort of spinning their wheels all the time. There's probably some overriding global social issues. We we have we have downplayed the value of hard work uh, here in this country, in Europe, other places. Work, hard, doing something hard work has been uh, almost in many in many cases um, kind of looked down upon. Um, schools uh, take everybody. And we expect then to just do what we want to do and have people like it. And that's just not the case. I think also the, um, the gear manufacturers and the websites that, that focus all on gear, I certainly don't think there's anything wrong with them. I don't want to put them out of business. I'm fine. And, you know, we're not going to argue about it. Um, but they also present sort of like a... A soft sell that if you have a Canon 5D Mark III, you'll be able to take really good pictures. Uh, first of all, that's a lie. It's not a it's not a 
blurring of words. It's not a sort of what it's not as it's not what it's a lie. Having a 5D Mark III will only allow you to take a photograph on a 5D Mark III. Whether it's good or not has nothing at all to do with that camera or whether the, the lens you have has a red stripe on it or whether you're shooting the newest Nikon or how many megapixels you have. All of those things are sold as if I get something the best gear, I'll make the best photographs. And the disappointment, of course, happens when that's not the case. If you're taking really terrible pictures on your Rebel, um, you're probably going to take really terrible pictures on your your 5D Mark III. Or your iPhone. Or your iPhone. If you can't take a good photograph on the iPhone, I mean a decent photograph on the iPhone, I'm not sure a 5D Mark III with a wide-angle lens is going to save you. I really don't. Um, now, if, if, if we're going to go down the pixel peeping route where a good photograph is judged by how many pixels it has or how, quote, sharp it is or what the dynamic range of something is. Um, I don't, I, well, you know me, Seshu. I, I find I, that stuff, I start to nod <laughs> off. <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, I, I just love photographs. And if it's a great photograph from an iPhone or an yeah. Android or, or uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter yeah. if it's, if it's cool and I like to look at it, then I'm just thrilled. So right, right. Um, I, I do think there, that are the, those are the two uh, biggest issues. And the, the, the belief that since photography went digital, that it's free. If you've got a 32 gig card, you can stick it in your camera. You don't have to buy film anymore. So photography is free. Well, you know, if you, for that matter, playing the flute is really free because you just blow air through it. <laughs> and yet, and there's no, there's not a flute player out there who who hasn't gone and taken lessons and studied and played scales and everything. Right. You don't get out. No one gets out free. Yeah. Um, it's a, and it can be very disappointing, I think, for photographers to go that route. There is one particular article in this new book uh, which touches on uh, where imitation is carried too far. I mean, that's the title of your your article. Um, I think we we. You may be referring to the current crop of photographers, and there's been many who are, uh, you know, who are who are eager to do, who do invest in workshops, go to workshops, and when they come back, uh, their work looks like those of the workshop instructor. Sure. I uh, and I think I feel like that that's another topic that's probably rather contentious among photographers where. It's fine. You can you can, I guess, copy or imitate uh, somebody you really are inspired by. But then, what does it take to break away from that and really create your own? I mean, make your own mark. Uh, essentially, come up with your own style. What is it? What is it that's preventing photographers from making that jump? There's there's, there's two questions there. Uh, one on style and one on the imitation. Um, as you well know, I like jazz. Mm -hmm. um, I listen to jazz all the time. And one of the great jazz trumpet players, Clark Terry, is famous for a quote. Imitate, assimilate, innovate. If you're going to play jazz, the first thing you want to you, you do, no matter, I don't know whether you're a drummer like me or a trumpet player, is you want to you want to play like Miles. You, you just you want to. Be able to, you know, so you get out one of, you know, sketches of Spain and Miles goes, but da do da and you go, but da do do no, but da do you just, then you got it. Then you, after a while, it's assimilated into you. You can play like Miles, no problem. But now you've got to innovate. So now you take the fact that you wood shedded to get all those notes and your finger and your mouth to work together. And now you got to make something on your own. Too many people stop at number two and they don't go on. It's very, it's hard. Number one is hard. Number two happens gradually. You don't even feel it happening. M number three is really hard. That's where you have to take, you make your own voice. So you can go to a photo workshop um, like I did back in the analog days and we, we learn how to make a print like a Fred Tripp. Fred Picker or uh, uh, somebody who's teaching us. So we look at all of their techniques and then we try to do it and we try to, we finally hit it. 
But if we just stay there, then we haven't done anything except become another little clone of them. We've got to move on and innovate. Now, you asked me about style, and style is something that, um, that well, first of all, your style cannot come from a $29 plug-in. If it does, you're in trouble. Because um, everybody else can buy that plug-in, and suddenly it's not a style anymore. But a style is something that you discover looking back. You don't look forward. If you say, well, here's the style I'm going to do. All you're showing me is who you're going to imitate and assimilate. If you take that as a driving force to create something all your own, then you've innovated. But the innovation, sometimes you don't see it when you're in the middle of it. You don't see that style starting to emerge and evolve until you at some point stop and look back and say, wow, this body of work I've created over the past year or two years kind of has a a feel that I'm, I, I see, these are the shots I really love. These shots are, eh, they're okay. And these shots, I wish I hadn't shot them. Well, those ones you really love, they're probably going to have a distinct style, something that drives them forward. And a photographer can have style and shoot what I call pure photography, someone like a Jake Stengel or a uh, Scott Tepfer. Um, the stuff looks like film. I mean, they're not Photoshopping really anything. Um, and then you get into someone like uh, uh, Eric Almas, which everything is assembled. And both of, you know, all of those photographers have style. Mm. It's just a different style. So um, look back at the style after you've innovated. There is absolutely nothing wrong, by the way, with um, looking at another photographer and trying to figure out how he got those. If you like Joel Grimes and you want to figure out how Joel Grimes gets that shot, then bust your ass until you go, damn, Joel couldn't tell the difference. If I put this in his, in his portfolio, he would say, oh, I don't remember shooting that. Great. But you haven't stopped. That's just that's, to the point. That's, that's number two. That's step two. That's right. Now, what are you going to do with it? Because right. if you're going to go out and shoot athletes, yep. you're just another, you know, wannabe. Who wants to shoot with you? There'll be some people who will. The people who can't afford Joel or... <laughs> whatever they will but you'll you'll never make a mark and you'll never be able to move from price point competition and that's the goal of photography is we want to not be price point photographers what in the photo industry resonates with you the most right now that's positive oh that's positive Ooh, lots of things i love uh, that the the cam camera manufacturers are starting to slow down with all the whiz bang stuff and present us with some good quality um, cameras and lenses, et cetera, that makes sense. Um, I have uh, big cannons. I don't know if I'll buy another big cannon. I, this may be my last really big camera. I'm looking at some of the smaller cameras and just absolutely loving what I'm seeing. Price points are, you know, you can, you can pick up a whole Fuji system for darn near, I mean, it's an exaggeration, but darn near 1L lens. Uh, you could have a Fuji and a couple of lenses. And so uh, quality, et cetera, is, uh, is really great. I also think there is a, is a tendency now for people to start looking for excellence again. Um, it was one thing... Uh, when we were all, you know, in digital and we discovered all these new things we could do, and now, okay, they're not that they're not that new anymore. They're not that fresh anymore. And now we're starting to say, okay, fine, but what can we do with this? And uh, I think that's that's positive. I think photography. I think it's a great time to be a photographer. Uh, one of the things that bugs me is when people say, usually with a sort of a a frown, they'll say, oh well, everybody's a photographer now. And I think, yeah, that's great because. The other language that I speak fluently is music. And if you go to France and they put a symphony in front of you, you don't have to speak French. Those notes are those notes. Uh, all, all notes are the same. And might be some little, you know, sectarian areas where music is written differently. But across the world, from Japan to China to France to Turkey to Istanbul, I mean, all five, five lines, 
four spaces, mm. saves, um, key signatures. So everybody can talk. Photography is becoming another communication device. It's another way for the world to communicate. And I think that's fantastic. However, we teach everybody in, uh, well, I'll speak for America. Every kid in America who goes to school learns to write so that we can communicate. But very few kids become writers. And that's the same thing with photography. There's a lot of people who make photographs and love to do it. But you better, better be prepared to be a photographer to, to move above just the simple communication. The last question I have for you, and it's, it segues from that last point you just made, is what does it mean to be a photographer now in 2014? Oh, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Hmm, wish I had time to think about that one. What does it mean to be a photographer? Um, well, let's, let's start with the, uh, the uh, amateur uh, level photographer. I'm not even going to go to like my wife and my daughter. I mean, for them, I will, I will say that. Um, their number one Christmas gift this year was a point and shoot camera. Both of them wanted point and shoots. Now this is this is under you understand both of them have iPod touches and both of them have Android phones with cameras and they they fill them up all the time. But they wanted to go back to have a camera. They wanted a camera for the purse. The most important thing they gave me in order to choose the right camera for them was my daughter wanted purple and my wife wanted blue. Um, sorry, megapixel folks. That's what it came down to: purple and blue. So I had to get a Canon purple one and a Nikon blue one. Um, and then you move into the amateurs who who really um, want to make a better photograph. They don't want to quit their day job, their IT people, or what have. They don't want to quit that. They don't want to. They want to infringe on anybody else's thing. They just want to take it a step further than my wife and daughter and make a really great image. Then you get into the professional photographers, and their goal is to is to to do twofold. In commercial work, we certainly have a lot of a lot of jobs where our job is to solve a problem. We've got a popcorn making machine with a lot of chrome on it how do we make it work um, that's technical so the technical expertise becomes extremely valuable but at the same time a lot of photographers are, are saying how do I make a mark how do I do something in photography how do I create an image that other people look at and feel an emotion or or feel something towards that image and with all that we have at our disposal now it's become easier to do that from a technical standpoint and more difficult to do it because there's more people doing it than ever before. There's more incredible photographers today than ever before. I mean, amazing photographers who maybe would never have discovered photography if uh, you know, their wife hadn't gotten them a Rebel four or five years ago and a kit lens. And uh, you know, they went up and went to Strobist and learned how to take the camera flash and put it over there. And all of a sudden now they're doing amazing things. Some of them are pros and, and working uh, at, uh, at the job full time. So I think it's, I think it's, it's cool, but I think the most important thing photographers can do is to give back um, to all of the folks who want to learn. I think to be a photographer today means you should be giving back. That's wonderful. Um, with that, I want to say thank you, Don. Um, enjoy the, oh. Enjoy the wonderful weather out in Phoenix. Um, I'm I'm still very jealous of you. <laughs> I wish I could I could be out there. Uh, well, I hope you come out here sometime. I would love we'll, to. I'd love to. Yeah. Some uh, great Mexican food down by the studio and yeah. have a blast. Excellent. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I appreciate it. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye.